you know, now our next topic is one of the most difficult um, topics we even we can think about in youth mental health. Um, suicide, as many of you know, is the second leading cause of death in teens in our country. And one of the uh, foremost experts on this topic, Dr. Shashank Joshi, is with us. He's from Stanford University. And um, his approach to addressing suicide prevention is it's, it's revolutionary, it's extraordinary, and it's community-based, and schools-based, it's families-based, it's all about how we can encircle a child with the love and support um, and, and strategies to do that. And I remember before lunch, Dr. Piacentini talked about that seamless continuum of care, of community, of a, of a, of a young person. So it is my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Dr. Joshi. Um, he's a professor of psychiatry, pediatrics, and education at the Stanford University School of Medicine and the Graduate School of Education. So Dr. Joshi, join us, please. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Tegan. That was really outstanding and very fitting because Lori just helped us understand how singing and music is vital um, for not only whom we all just heard, but also for so many of our young people. And that vitality, I think, is also reflected in the work of AIM. <clears throat> and I first got to know about the work of AIM right when Susan was starting it several years ago. And we know that AIM is working and has been working to get the best treatments implemented and disseminated where young people are being treated and even places where they may not be able to access treatment in the usual way. And so I'm really proud and feel very privileged to be part of this symposium where AIM is bridging the gap between what we know and what we have yet to do. So with that, um, I'm just going to ask for the sound man who's very talented back there to modulate because I have spent a few years on stage and I tend to project and right now I'm getting a little feedback. So hopefully you all can hear me uh, on the video as well. And so I am going to be speaking about some things we've learned over the past 10 years. And I'm going to go a little bit quickly because I want to make sure we have enough time for Dr. Pelayo. And then we're going to have a panel with some of the speakers. So the first um, slide, I can actually move this myself, which is great. Um, it's just a thank you slide for those of you who recognize this. Um, it's a campus not too far from here. And um, I have no financial or other conflicts of interest related to the talk, but my hope is that after our time together, you will be able to list not only the risk factors, which probably you know about already, but importantly, the protective factors in youth suicide and describe effective strategies that may include university community partnerships. I'm going to be sharing some of the lessons that we've had with Stanford and the Bay Area Community Partnerships. I'd like you to be able to identify cultural opportunities and barriers for implementing suicide prevention strategies that are school-based, even the ones that we know that seem so elusive, even when there's a lot of science to support these kinds of interventions. And finally, I'm going to end with um, some strategies that I hope you'll be able to take away to cultivate your own well-being and those of your friends and colleagues. So putting this all into perspective, <clears throat> about two to three percent of American high school students, we have 65 to 70 million going to public school every day, about two to three percent will make a serious suicide attempt annually. One that comes into the emergency room that might be seen by someone from your team or my team so in a school of 2,000, this means somewhere between 40 and 60 students. So when I try to bring the message to school boards, I will often start with this statistic. Um, this graphic was shared by Monica Nepomuceno from the California Department of Ed, who's been a very important community partner to implement best practice across the state. 
um, you know, the board members start to squirm in their seats a little bit because they know that if they have not yet lost a student in their district, they may know a family or they may know a district where there has been loss. And so I like to sh start with this perspective. Um, even though my slide is currently stuck, it is now moving. So uh, I believe I even have a laser here, which I don't know if you can see that laser on the board. Yes, can you see that? kind of moving thing. All right, so on the left, there's a green dot that doesn't stay on for very long, but um, this is a rather old slide, but I like to use it. It's from John Mann at Columbia, and it's a really nice overall illustration. And very briefly, what we're doing today on the left is we're looking at, um, what I'm gonna talk about now is when there's just the wrong combination of stressful life events with an underlying mood or psychiatric condition. Um, sometimes a stressful life event is interpersonal, sometimes it's systemic. Um, obviously in COVID-19, we've had a number of things that have felt out of our control. And even as we reemerge post-pandemic, there are still some things that for young people may feel very unsettling. And especially now we're in the spring, it's actually a time many kids have been looking forward to. It's also a time when depression, it's one of the peaks of youth depression during the year, and that may lead to some thinking about suicide. Now, as I talk through my slides, um, you do have uh, some resources that were shared earlier, and if any of you, if any of the things I talk about here feel uncomfortable or triggering or whatever it might be, it's okay if you wanna step out, if you need to. We do have resources. There are people that have the AIM lanyards on that can connect you to someone who you can talk with. Sometimes just discussing this, while it can be helpful in most cases, for others it might be triggering. So um, what happens between this thinking about suicide? You know, we have 15 to 20% of American youth think about suicide every year. They think seriously about it but only two to 3% make a serious attempt. So what happens between that thinking about and making an attempt? Well, the factors, as you see on the left there, involve things like impulsivity with the developing brain, a sense of hopelessness or pessimism. Um, two of the things we've learned, access to lethal means, and in San Francisco, it may be a place like the Golden Gate Bridge, in Palo Alto and Los Gatos and other communities. It might be at a train. Um, so teenagers in particular are vulnerable to imitation. How these stories are covered in the media, whether they are adhering to best practice guidelines about how to tell the story, well, that can be very helpful. But if the story is told poorly, as we learned from the CDC epi -Aid study in Santa Clara County in 2016, um, it can actually be very harmful, depending on how the writer portrays the story. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that when I tell you a little more about the Palo Alto story. Now on the right, in blue, as Dr. Mann has illustrated, this is part of what we're doing today with uh, AIM and these conferences where we do education and awareness with folks like you. You are gatekeepers. You are teachers and parents and students and some of you are therapists, some of you are just interested others, some of you may be scientists, some of you may be in primary care, some of you may be in some kind of therapeutic work. But all of you have a role. And as our dear friend and mentor, Dr. Hinshaw taught us, has taught us about his work in stigma, how can we defeat such a large entity? It doesn't, it's not hard to define it, you kind of know it when you see it, one conversation at a time. When I drove in here and I met with Susan outside, I saw a lot of conversations happening about the things that were being discussed this morning. And that's awesome. And this is an invitation to continue that conversation when you leave after today. So education and awareness with the general public, with primary care providers, that was mentioned a couple of talks ago, and with community or organizational gatekeepers such as teachers. We have screening for individuals at high risk. People who've made past attempts are at higher risk. People who've had loss in their community are at higher risk. And then we have treatment. Some of this was covered um, 
focusing specifically on suicide. I won't spend too much time. We'll save it for the panel. But essentially, just as Dr. Piazzantini and um, uh, Dr. Insel, Dr. K, um, all of the folks here have tried to highlight, um, uh, even Dr. Hinshaw, combination treatment when you have moderate to severe conditions that may put you at risk for suicide typically is the most evidence-based. And follow-up care, very important. After they leave the hospital, what happens? Do we have a warm handoff to a good enough system? We know the system is broken. We've tried to MacGyver the system together, and in some communities, there are some novel kinds of projects sprouting up. Ohana, for example, in, uh, in this area, where uh, benefactors put their money together. AIM, for example, where donors and benefactors put their money together. Think about how do we translate the best research into practice. Uh, letter F is restriction of access to lethal means and then media reporting guidelines, which I'm going to spend a few minutes on. So moving right along, I'm going to talk about suicide clusters now. So teenagers in particular are vulnerable to clusters. And media has a large part to play. Things like front page stories, headlines, simplistic explanations of the cause of why someone might have died. They had a fight with their boyfriend, girlfriend, love interest, and so they died. And then there may be graphic representation or specific details shared of how the person died. They may use the teenager's photo. They may use an adult's photo, which might trigger a teenager. So there are a number of best practices that have been developed by the media for the media over the last 15 to 20 years. So our amazing Stanford graduate, Chloe Sorensen, did an interesting study for which she won an award for the best senior thesis last year. She wanted to study why was it that very thoughtful journalists who are writing good stories sometimes were publishing, and these stories were not adhering to best practice. What was that about? So she interviewed outlets such as the New York Times and smaller outlets such as college newspapers in Ithaca, for example, where Cornell is, where they've lost a number of students. And over time, she came to realize some very simple things. Number one, the writer may write the story according to the guidelines, but the news editor, the newsroom editor, or the headline editor may actually change some things because they may not be aware of what the guidelines are. So fast forward now, last month, Chloe and some of our colleagues published a tool which is available for free called Tempos, the tool for evaluating media portrayals of suicide. This was published in a peer-reviewed journal. It is open source. Anyone can look at it, and there's actually an online algorithm. I put the website there that you can plug in your article in and check your own score and see if you're adhering. We're now working with college newspaper outlets and high school newspaper outlets are next so that we are able to share what we've learned around best practice, particularly for those people writing stories where there may be vulnerable populations, which is why we're all here today. This is about youth and young adults and families. So very briefly, I live in the Stanford community. It's an amazing place to raise children. I will say that each of our three boys has a higher than usual risk because they have had, in, in Palo Alto and Los Gatos and Santa Clara County, we have suicide in our family history. And so when someone comes in and is a new superintendent or is a new chief of police or maybe is a new head of hospital, it's important for them that we get to be at the table to share our story so that they know where we've been, what work we've done, the things we have learned. So we were shaken by two suicide clusters, one in 2009-10 and then in 2014-15. We came together as a coalition, Project Safety Net. These were all of the important NGOs and civic organizations that you can imagine, community therapists, the hospital, um, uh, the universities, the school district, the PTA, the Santa Clara County Health Department, you name it. We were all very eager and we kind of looked like this. We were a little frenetic. We had a lot of good ideas. It was hard to corral them. You know, we, would, we, we formed Project Safety Net at that time, but we were meeting as PSN between the hours of 
9 and 3. So we are about youth. We are for youth. We are trying to help youth promote youth mental health and well-being while trying to address suicide. So anyone tell me the problem with meeting during those hours? Where are the youth exactly? How do you hold these meetings during school hours? Well, over time, I think the youth schooled us and we became a more intentional community network that could foster youth well-being. With mobilized young people in the middle in that yellow circle, with activated sectors and engaged adults, and on the lower left, invigorated evidence-based programs where evidence was available, influencing civic decisions. You know, we have two school board members who are high school students, one from each comprehensive high school. And although they are non-voting, they are very vocal every other Tuesday night at those meetings. And so this was part of what we might conceptualize as a social ecological model. How many of you have seen this or heard of this before? This is Brenner's social ecological model. Some hands up in the audience. We have not only the individual young person, they are nested within a larger community of family and friends and workplaces and schools and community. Dr. Insel touched on this a bit in terms of um, what kinds of opportunities we're going to have hopefully with some of the new funding coming down um, uh, with regard to uh, some community opportunities. When he talked about people, place, and purpose, Schools are a very important place where young people gather every day. Even if you're homeschooled, you probably have two or three opportunities a week to gather with peers. So this is Project Safety Net in a social ecological model, the different organizations that are nested. And so we learned a lot about protective factors. Susan, how am I doing for time? We're good. Okay, so what do you say, 15 minutes? Okay, so protective factors. You and you and you and you and you and you, you are all protective factors. You are all part of the village. You are all part of the community of trusted adults. You are all part of the big family. Dr. K talked about FBT for anorexia nervosa. Jim Locke was my Sweet mate, his room is right next door to mine for many, many years. We talk so much about families. What is the right amount of family connectedness? Just looking on the left here, positive parent-child relationships. What's the right amount of parent involvement? Now, speaking to you as a recovering helicopter parent with a sophomore in college, sophomore in high school, and um, about to graduate, eighth grader go to high school. You know, what is the just right amount for my sophomore in college um, who has, you know, his ADD is now raging, his ADHD inattentive type, shout out to um, Stephen for helping us remember the nomenclature, it's confusing. He calls it ADD, okay, so using the patient's language. What's the just right amount? You know, we just had a family session about that last week because I wanted to check in, my wife and I wanted to say, what is the right amount? You tell us what's the right amount. And to our surprise, he actually said, it's okay when you call me in the morning three times to make sure I'm not oversleeping class. Because, yeah, I might have been gaming the night before a little later than I planned. What is the cultural value congruence that we can try to understand and capture? In the Bay Area, we have 50, 60, 70% families who are immigrants. 25% of our youth in this country are the immigrants or children of immigrants. And so how do we bridge that gap? How do we understand differential rates of acculturation? This is work that I'm blessed to be doing in our lab and in the culture and um, culture lab with Dr. Joyce Chu and, and Sita Patel at Palo Alto University to really understand for Latinx communities and Asian American communities, which are really the majority of our immigrant population in the Bay Area, what are the unique strengths that can mitigate some of the challenges when it comes to trying to raise bicultural youth to become adults. We know, if you go over to the right, that school connections are so important. The in-person connections, the everyday doses of dopamine and oxytocin that come from just saying hi to your friend, that come back from, you just come back from vacation and you're seeing your crush in class 
you're connecting with a trusted adult. Hopefully you can talk to a parent, but maybe not. Maybe you have someone in school. Maybe it's a counselor, but maybe it's a coach. Maybe it's the campus supervisor. But these everyday in-person connections we took for granted. We know from work that Peter Wyman and colleagues have done through studying sources of strength internationally, the school-wide well-being promotion suicide prevention program, it's not only how many adults are available, who can be reached out to. It's the perception of availability. It's one of the things we measure when we're doing big campus work. What do the students perceive around perception of availability of trusted adults? And finally, and probably most importantly, what we learned in the last 26 months, a sense of belonging, a sense of connection. You can be yourself and be at this school. It's not just about fitting in. If the student fits in, if I fit in, I have to be like you. But if I belong, I can be myself. And our young people need a sense of belonging and connection. Those are protective factors. And this comes right out of what's been called the interperson theory of suicide that Thomas Joyner and colleagues developed in Florida. And as applied to youth, and as applied to immigrant and refugee origin youth, it becomes so important to have that sense of belongingness and that it is not thwarted and that they do not feel like a burden, that they do not feel like they are disappointing their parents who worked so hard to come to this country. So that's part of our work in therapy is to help with identifying what the young person might be struggling with, especially if they are of immigrant origin because we've learned now from the research that asking about that sense of belonging and connection is so important. How they identify culturally. Do they have friends from their heritage culture, from their host culture, some of both? Having that conversation is so important. Eric Erickson talked about it decades and decades ago. It's still relevant today. How a person identifies. What are their values? What are their beliefs? Are they the same as, much different than, similar to their parents? or not. I'll get a little more into that if we have time during the panel. Social support and connectedness, being on a team, being able to be in theater, coming in person. Yes, you can do it on Zoom. It's way different in person. Being able to hear somewhere over the rainbow and that amazing presentation and beautiful voice that we heard was much different because you were here in the audience while she was singing here on stage. And then finally, beliefs against suicide. If you are from a culture or religion or a social group that has a strong taboo against suicide, where people may actually identify, okay, suicide is not a crime or a sin, which is why we've been moving away from the term commit. Um, and the last couple of popes have kind of made it their business to let the world know that we should not be thinking about it in that way. These are children of God who are suffering. Sometimes religiousness can be a protective factor if it is implemented and if it, if it is utilized and internalized in a way that may be helpful. So again, important to ask about spiritual or religious beliefs. They may even be practicing some sort of secular spirituality or mindfulness. Understanding and tapping into, is there something that's bigger than themselves that they are connected with that might be a reason to continue to go on living when they are in severe distress? Now, talking about schools for the next few minutes, I did talk about how we have many, many students who are not progressing academically, primarily because of mental health reasons. And so when it comes to immigrants and immigrant populations, and what we like to teach in my training program where I've been for the last 22 years, and I've been fortunate to raise legions of future child psychiatrists, some of which are here in your area, along with my amazing training team and associate program directors, that we know that there's never gonna be enough mental health providers. How do we get the care to the kids? Well, we think about schools and school mental health because that's where the kids are. I think someone mentioned in the very first talk, um, maybe it was Dr. Insel, maybe it was another speaker or another event, but 75, 80% of our mental health care for youth is being delivered in schools. And so this is why the evidence base and the implementation science has really been a focus for NIMH and for foundations like AIM to say, how do we take 
CBT or interpersonal therapy or DBT and apply it in the school setting? Is there a way to do that? Well, in general, because they're time limited, because they're manualized, just because they're manualized doesn't mean it's robotic. There's still a lot of room for nuance and art and skill when implementing manually based time limited treatments. But they lend themselves so well to school because school staff can be trained and these have evidence that they work. Now when we're talking about depression, depression is among the most common conditions that if not addressed properly may lead to from stress to distress to desperation and if depression is underneath we need to identify so we can treat it. 20 to 25 percent of our young people will experience some kind of depression before walking across a stage like this to get their diploma. When we give talks in classrooms and we implement uh, a, a best practice curriculum called Break Free from Depression, it's out of Harvard Medical School, Children's Hospital Boston. You can look it up. You can get trained for free to implement this program at your school. And it basically talks about depression, the medical illness. Differentiates it from everyday sadness or occasional sadness that's part of a young person's life. But we talk about this with students because students are the ones who can identify this in themselves or a friend. And we've seen over and over where they can actually get help for a friend when that person may not want to get help themselves. We know in the pandemic, although suicide rates have not gone up as fast as depression and anxiety rates have, we know that if we don't address the depression and anxiety as it presents, hopefully upstream, again, our distress can turn to desperation, and desperation may lead to uh, thinking about suicide. So this is a very, uh, compared to the brain slides that folks like um, Dr. K and others showed you and Dr. Insel, this is just a, an open source old school slide, sagittal view. If you took my brain, I'm looking this way, here's the front of my brain, back of my brain. From, um, from NIDA, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. And I just illustrate it, because again, when I'm in front of a school board, or I'm in front of a superintendent's meeting, and they're a little suspicious about what I'm trying to do, they think I'm gonna try to turn the whole district into a community mental health center. And although school districts are not a community mental health center, they find themselves, as Dr. Inso reminds us, at the center of the community for youth. Youth come to school with a brain, brains that are healthy and they need to be healthy enough to learn. Students have to be healthy enough to learn, teachers have to be healthy enough to teach, staff have to feel supported and empowered to lead. That is how we get our kids through a school year. We're approaching the end of a school year. So let me just highlight this. On the right side, highlighting the serotonin pathways on this cartoon, I'll say, well, you may have heard of serotonin, not just because you came to this talk and you heard about Dr. Piacentini and Dr. Hinshaw talking about serotonin pathways. But here we learn not only for mood, for depression, for anxiety treatment, first the psychotherapy and then the medication if needed. But look what else, memory processing, sleep, cognition, all the things you need to be healthy enough to learn. This is why we need to teach about the brain in schools. Kids have to be healthy enough to learn. Culture is everywhere. Every family interaction with me, every case, every clinical referral is cross-cultural. Even if I'm dealing with another second-born Indian American, cheesehead Packers fan who also likes the Warriors and the Giants because he raised three kids in the Bay Area with his wife, okay, you've met one. There are actually a few of me around like that. So, you might know a little about my cultural background, that helps get the conversation going, but at the end of the day, it's an individual story with an individual family, and you're always working cross-culturally. So I'm gonna invite you to work cross-culturally and think about cultural nuances with every single patient, client, student interaction. So you've heard a lot about the genetics. Thank you for the time check. Talked a little bit about, learned a little bit about neurotransmitter imbalance and other medical disorders. In the pandemic, we've learned that these four spheres, biopsychosocial, cultural, interact. And so while we might have had teenagers who were pretty happy-go-lucky and optimistic and had pretty good coping skills and bounce back, um, 
we've also learned that in the pandemic, some of those everyday things that we took for granted started to get impacted. And they may have gone from glass half full to glass half empty. They may not have been connecting as much with their peers because it was all online. And how is this interfacing with the home environment? How are they talking about mental health or not? Is it allowed? Is it sanctioned? Is it encouraged? Is it discouraged? And so it is this interaction that we always have to keep in mind with any mental health condition. And I always like to invite people who come to talks like these to think about culture in every single patient interaction and appreciate the complexities of cultural assessment. We have to know when we don't know rather than making assumptions. We have to know and own our own biases and prejudices. And we have to know when to get a cultural consultation. You know, if I'm seeing a family who lives in Carmel by the sea versus seeing a family from Watsonville, seeing a family in Monterey, okay, it tells me they live in the area. So there's something about the area. I know I'm gonna ask about what kind of work they do if the parents work and I wanna know a little bit about the school and I wanna know what is it that brings this young person to me right now? And if we're like the third or fourth referral place and many of the folks you heard from this morning, we work in these specialty centers, what's the story? Sometimes we need to get a cultural consultation to truly understand it. Now in the interest of time, I, I won't go through too much of this, but you have all the slides. There's some really nice things that Dr. Barbara Stanley has shared with us around telehealth with suicidal individuals and how that can be adapted. So I just wanna highlight that. This is the CSSRS, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. There are now community adapted versions of this very simple six question measure. This one can be administered by teachers. This is the ASQ, the Ask Suicide Screening Questions. These are best practices. Now, even though we're coming back in person, some students still wanna meet electronically. They like telehealth. For some, it's even more safe than meeting in person. So I put in some things we've learned about adaptations when you're doing risk assessments. Safety planning, very important. You've probably all seen this if you're clinicians. The safety planning interventions is essentially seven steps. It starts with the within self strategies and builds to seeking help from professionals or agencies. It's things like, you know, what are the warning signs? What are your internal coping strategies? Who are the people in social settings that provide distraction for you, et cetera? Most importantly, step seven, the most important things for me to go on living for are. When you ask that question, when you end towards the end of the interview with that, you're generating a sense of hope. You wanna understand from them what are the things that are really important to you. So I wanna share one adaptation that was just published. So this again, feelings thermometer, CBT thermometer, I think it was shared a little earlier by some of the early speakers. Identifying the warning signs, this is red, orange, yellow, green. Um, my colleague Andy Tabuenka and Marie Gibson have simplified this for the inpatient unit. It's from a book that just got published a couple of months ago. We are the editors. When time is tight and stakes are high, pharmacotherapy alliances and the inpatient unit. You have this in your handout. Basically takes that CBT oriented feelings thermometer, red, yellow, green zone, and asks the patient to describe what happens when they're in the red zone. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are they doing? What might people notice to give them a clue that they can't actually tell them a color right now or a number from one to 10. They're just really in distress. So we work on the safety planning tool while they're on the inpatient unit. And here are red, yellow, green with some specifics filled out. You have that in your handout. So that you can learn how you might adapt this to your particular setting. So last three slides. We know we, we've all been living the COVID-19 pandemic. It turned all of our lives upside down. For any of you who speak or read Mandarin or Cantonese, you'll recognize this symbol for crisis right, with danger and opportunity, it's the same symbol. So out of crisis or danger comes opportunity. Not all distance learning is bad. You know, Susan and Lori put this show together because we had distance learning, we had hybrid. Students actually can do well. E-learning requires less time to learn than in a traditional classroom. 
at times because students can learn at their own pace. Other students need to connect in person with their teachers, but we think that online learning will catalyze an educational shift from traditional to more hybrid as the norm. Now, I'm from Stanford. I love to shout out Berkeley, not just because Steve Hinshaw is one of my favorite people, but there's a wonderful article written by Brooke Anderson in March of 2020. They published this. It's called Guide to Wellbeing During Lockdown. And she shared the six daily questions for quarantine. And I just invite you to look at them and maybe during question and answer we'll have a time to take a look. I think they're still relevant. We're not in lockdown now, but these questions are really good reminders for us as part of everyday well-being practice. This is a book published by my colleague Grace Jong-gu, who's director of well-being in our department. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. So we're balancing the negative input of the stress and time and energy demands, and our battery is low, and we're at risk for burnout. So our positive input are the things that you do to keep yourself going, to keep your battery charged, to keep you resilient. So what you're trying to do is, little by little, you build coping capacity. And I think the six daily questions for quarantine will help you all build your capacity. Finally, gratitude practice, which I just shared a study from British Medical Journal looking at the three good things or three blessings practice every night for two weeks and what it meant for healthcare workers. It's a free 10 minute exercise you can do yourselves and find yourself at substantially low risk for depression and anxiety six months from now compared to people who never did it. And finally, self-valuation, growth mindset. It means you prioritize your personal well-being and growth mindset in response to mistakes. You never waste a good mistake, and you especially never waste a bad mistake. You learn from it and you move on. Lower self-valuation is associated with higher risk for burnout. This is our colleague Mickey Trockel at Stanford who started WellMD and WellPhD to support the clinicians. This is the concept of self-valuation. And finally, a place where we've convened a lot of these best practices online for free, the K-12 Toolkit for Mental Health Promotion and Suicide Prevention. Um, and if you're, it's open source, you can just search for HERD K-12 Toolkit. HERD, like I heard you, Healthcare Alliance in Response to Adolescent Depression. We started this after the first cluster in Palo Alto with a number of colleagues you see there. It's a collaboration among school leaders, mental health, and primary care leaders. So, this is my um, set of resources, which I'm going to leave you with. And I thank you. There's my contact information. Turning it back to you, thank you. Marie. Thank you. Thank you.